Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1? And uh, also, um, if you should have my translation of Zephaniah in front of you. And uh, it's up through the first 16 verses of the chapter, and it's only 18 verses in the chapter. So I'll be finishing off translating uh, the first chapter of Zephaniah beginning of next week. So I'll be sending out to our internet people a, a, a revision of this translation of chapter 1 of the book of Zephaniah. And uh, so you should have that in front of you, Zephaniah 1.1, 1, 1, and your Bible's open to that passage. And we're going to continue our study of chapter 1 of the book of Zephaniah. We began that study last evening uh, and verse 1. And then this evening we're going to be uh, looking at verse 2, which talks about uh, God uh, uh, proclaiming that he's going uh, a universal judgment, which we're going to see is uh, related to, uh, it's kind of interesting, there's a, some, a bit of hyperbole involved in this, in this statement here. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that. And there's several different kind of figures of speech being used here, like alliteration and paranomasia, pretty interesting stuff, and, um, and also uh, hyperbole. So I mentioned this in the introduction. There's a lot of different figure, cool figures of speech in this being used by Zephaniah in this book, and three of them we'll be noting here this evening. But we'll be talking about universal judgment. The judgment, uh, it's actually, as we'll see, fulfilled in a near sense uh, in, uh, the with the Babylonian invasions and uh, the 6th century BC. But ultimately, they're speaking of, verse uh, 2 is actually speaking ultimately of the tribulation portion of Daniel's 70th week. So we've got a lot of ground to cover here this evening. So let's take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves, to determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father. The confession of sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, restores us to fellowship with God, and we maintain that fellowship with God by obeying what the Spirit teaches us in the scriptures, that's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit, and that's synonymous with letting the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. Colossians 3.16, they're synonymous because 2 Peter 1.20 and 21 uh, states that uh, the Holy Spirit has inspired the human authors of Scripture. He basically is the divine author of the Bible. So uh, with that being said, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us to study your word. We thank you for this study in the book of Zephaniah. We pray that the Spirit would guide us and direct us in this study and speak to each one of us here this evening and also as a corporate unit. We pray that you would empower me to communicate accurately your word so that your people can be built up and edified spiritually and by the power of the Spirit help people to learn, understand, and apply what they're learning. We pray, Father, that the, myself and the audience would be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. And we pray, Father, that this study would also ultimately bring glory to you and your Son, Jesus Christ, as we uh, make application of what we're studying here in the book of Zephaniah. So, Father, we pray for this uh, service and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So this evening we're going to be studying Zephaniah 1-2, which speaks of a universal judgment. As I said before, it was we're going to see this a lot in the book of Zephaniah. Uh, this prophecy in verse 2 is actually fulfilled in a near sense, we could say, uh, with the Babylonian invasions of the 6th century B.C. And then ultimately the, the, it'll be fulfilled during the tribulation portion of Daniel's 70th week, which is still yet future. The tribulation portion is the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week, that seven-year period that we study studied in the book of uh, Daniel, and also we studied, it, we studied that uh, in the Day of the Lord series. So a lot of things we studied in the past are going to help us in our study of Zephaniah. So uh, uh, we're going to uh, look at Zephaniah 1-2. So let's, what I want to do is let's, let's start off by uh, looking at Zephaniah 1-1, and we'll read, what I want to do is we'll read all the way through verse 6. Uh, we'll do that, Zephaniah chapter 1, 
uh, verses 1 through 6. We'll read those verses. So it says, and I'm, I'm reading at this point from the, the, uh, the New American Standard, the word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off all the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests and those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven, and those who bow down and swear to the Lord, and yet swear by Milcom, and those who have turned back from following the Lord, and those who have not sought the Lord or inquired of him. Now, uh, if, you, if I may, let me read from my, those very same verses from my translation. Zephaniah 1.1, 1, 1, the message originating from the Lord, was communicated to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, grandson of Gedaliah, great-grandson of Amariah, great-great-grandson of Hezekiah, during the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Now, this is a lot more uh, specific by translation than the New American Standard. I will surely exterminate, yes, I'm about to cause every living thing to be destroyed on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I'm about to cause the human race as well as the animal kingdom to be destroyed. I'm about to cause the birds belonging to the earth's atmosphere as well as aquatic life belonging to the various bodies of water to be destroyed. Likewise, the wicked who produce their idolatrous obstacles. Yes, I will bring about the violent execution of the human race residing on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I will surely stretch out my hand against Judah, as well as each and every one of Jerusalem's inhabitants. Specifically, I will bring about the violent removal from this place, the number belonging to Baal, the well-known pagan priests. Also, those who repeatedly prostrate themselves on their house, uh, rooftops before the multitude of celestial bodies belonging to the stellar universe. Likewise, those who bind themselves by a promise to remain loyal to the Lord, while at the same time they bind themselves by a promise to remain loyal to the king. Yes, those who turn themselves back from following after the Lord. Specifically, those who never make it their habit of seeking after the Lord's will. Consequently, they never make it their habit of making a request of him. So those are the first six verses the, uh, we read from the New American Standard. We read from my translation, which reflects my interpretation, which as we go through the book, uh, we'll uh, be explaining this tra uh, translation. So in, in, the, in, in the New American Standard, which is the, the Bible we use to, uh, to uh, work off as a study Bible, and uh, it says in verse 2, I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Now, the, the phrase, I will completely remove, uh, is actually two verbs uh, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew. And it actually forms a couple of uh, figures, alliteration, as we'll see, and also paranomasia. We'll talk about what that means uh, briefly here this evening. Now, the first verb is the verb asaf. This word contains the idea of God's judgment, and it literally means to gather, to, to remove. And figuratively, it means to exterminate. Now, it is employed with another Hebrew verb, which is in the Hifil stem. It's the word samish vape. Samish vape means to bring to an end. Now, this verb, samish, pa, uh, samish vape, it is used in the Old Testament in context where divine judgment is imminent, and such is the case here in Zephaniah 1-2. Now, the verb asaf is in the Hifil stem. I think I said uh, erroneously that uh, uh, samish vape was. Uh, this word, uh, actually it is, samish vape is, I, didn't look, I, I looked at the wrong verb. Samish vape is actually in the hifel stem, like I said before, and it's in what we call the causative, it's a causative hifel stem. What does that mean to us? It indicates that the Lord, as the subject of this verb, will cause the earth's inhabitants, both mankind and the animal kingdom, to die. So this brings out the judgment, the fact that God is judged. He is the ultimate cause of these people's death. 
and the, uh, the, this universal judgment. Remember, God uses instruments to bring about this universal judgment. Uh, as we saw in the past, he used the Assyrian invasion to take out this, the northern kingdom of Israel. And then he used the kingdom of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar to uh, uh, invade uh, Jerusalem and Judah. And there was three, deport, three, de three different de deportations and 605, 597, and 587 BC. And these deportations of the, uh, the kingdom of Judah to the land of Babylon. So God used Nebuchadnezzar as his instrument, and he was an evil ruler. He didn't get, you know, it wasn't until, you know, later on in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter, end of chapter three, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were delivered from the flames by the Lord, that Nebuchadnezzar actually became a believer. And it wasn't until he was humbled in Daniel chapter four after that, then he became a positive believer. But this is before he, but when he did the, when he was a, uh, uh, doing these invasions of Judah and the Middle East and the Mesopotamian region. He was an unbeliever. He was a, a wicked pagan ruler, a butcher. And uh, we see that God used him as his instrument. He actually, uh, God says about him in the book of Jeremiah, as we saw in the book of Daniel, that he called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. So God will use instruments, people, to bring about his judgments. In fact, if we, when we study the Day of the Lord series, and I think we mentioned this in, we had to mention this in Daniel when we were studying the 70th week, that God says he will gather the nations uh, for Armageddon in the, in the tribulation period, the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. It's the Lord who's the ultimate cause of it. So how can that be? Uh, how can God be the ultimate cause of this universal judgment uh, when he doesn't, he, he is not, uh, uh, if, he's, if he's not physically or uh, personally uh, and doing this, how can he? How can he be the cause of it in using these people, these uh, nations, as his instruments? Simple. God, he has. He's omniscient. He's sovereign, and he decreed these negative decisions towards him by these evil nations and evil rulers uh, would be a part of his plan. He already fingered these things into his plan because he's omniscient, and he sovereignly said these things will take place, whether they're positive for me or against me. So no matter what Satan ever did or any other evil ruler or in the past or today or Antichrist in the future or whoever is an evil ruler in the future, whoever these people are, God has figured these decisions of theirs, their negative decisions toward him into his plan. So he actually can use evil against itself. So as I said before, he uses Babylon to take out this, the kingdom of Judah, but the kingdom of Judah was... The believers were in apostasy, and there were, there were people who were unregenerate there, who were unrepentant, would never trust in the Lord, and they, be, they were very wicked people, and they were corrupt in their political and religious and social uh, uh, function. And so God took another evil nation, Babylon, to destroy their evil, that evil nation. And then when Babylon had, had completed his purpose, he, what did he do? He brought in the Medes, the Medes and the Persians. Remember we studied in Daniel, who followed the Medes and the, uh, the Babylon after, was, after Babylon fall, fell as a world empire? The Medes and the Persians. Then who took them out as a world empire? The, uh, the Alexander's Greece. And then who took care of Alexander's Greece, uh, Grecian empire? Well, the Roman Empire, and eventually the Roman Empire falls apart. So nations, are evil. God rules the world, and when you see you know, nations rising and falling on the, on the world stage, like as I gave an example, Britain, you know, Britain used to be, you have something to do? Yeah, why don't you go ahead? At the, uh, when you Britain, there's, at, at one time, and, you know, in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, the uh, the nineteen uh, the, uh, the 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 sun, the sun never set in the Union Jack. I mean, their flag was all around the world. Their navy dominated the world for years. They had the the pound was the the uh, the world's currency. It was based upon the pound. What happened in the beginning of World War One? And World War One, they lost the flower of their army, their youth. And what happened was they became, they started falling economically and then militarily. And then we get to World War II. If it wasn't for the United States, they would have been uh, isolated by Nazi Germany or would have been taken over by Nazi Germany. And so the American dollar uh, uh, t uh, overtook the pound and the, economically the United States became the superpower and the world, the military power of the world. And so, and the, uh, the, uh, also the, uh, the entertainment capital of the world with the arts and all that stuff. It switched over to the United States, and it's been like this for about 100 years, but that could change as well. So who, all this rising and falling of nations and rulers coming and going, 
It's all because God sovereignly decreed this. Very important that we see this. So when I see this, the hifil stem of this word, samish vapeh, it's a causative and it indicates that the Lord, as the subject of this verb, will cause the earth's inhabitants, both mankind and the animal kingdom, to die. He'll be the ultimate cause, and he will use an instrument to do this. He can use angels, or he could use uh, human beings to carry out his bidding. Now, everything, nothing is outside the will of God. Every, not even a sparrow falling to the ground, or a hair falling out of my head and they've all fallen out of my head. Those are all in, included in God's plan. Nothing is outside his will. Nothing takes God, God by surprise. So he's the ultimate cause of this judgment. And then the participle form of this verb is, is actually uh, for imminent action. So that would indicate an action that is about to occur, and it expresses the idea that this universal judgment is imminent. Now, as I pointed out in our introduction and last evening, when Zephaniah wrote this prophecy, it's between 630 and 635 BC, early in the reign of Josiah, before he's even an adult. Uh, Zephaniah is, is issuing this prophecy. And within 25, 30 years, in 605 BC, the first of the three Babylonian invasions of Judah took place. And the first of three de deportations took place. So it was imminent. Now, it didn't happen the very next day, uh, Zephaniah issued this prophecy, but it happened within, the, the 20, uh, within 25, 30 years. Now, well, why did God delay? Why didn't he just do it immediately? Because as we pointed out, and we'll continue to point this out, it's very important we point this out, God wanted people to repent. He was going to use this threat of, of, uh, of, annihil uh, of uh, destruction and universal judgment to get the non-believers to trust in him. Repentance for them would be stop dis uh, disregard, uh, rejecting God, the God of Israel, as the creator and the ruler of the earth and savior, trust in him. Or for the believers in apostasy, that repentance would, would involve confession of sin and then getting to stay in fellowship with God like we do, maintaining that fellowship by obeying God's word. So we see here that this, uh, this action is imminent and God was, it was 25, 30 years before the first of the three invasions took place. So it's, it's, it was a God didn't uh, immediately execute this judgment against the earth's inhabitants because he wants people to repent. And also, you got to remember too, that right now we're, pri we're, we're living before Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation period, once the rapture takes place, that's the next prophetic event that we're waiting for, the resurrection of the church, that's imminent as well, could happen at any time. It was, they were looking forward to it in the first century. It's 2,000 years have passed, how much closer now it is than it was in the days of the apostles. How much closer? So we have a lot of things that could uh, there seem to think, or would appear that it's, it's very, getting very close, very close, because the things that are gonna take place in the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week, a lot of those things we could see now with technology advancement, those things taking place. And also, the emergence of Israel back in the land after 2,000 years, not in the land, and now back in the land since 1948, all right? And they have, they're now in the land. That, uh, so that's a big indication that we could be very close to the rapture of the church as well. And, uh, and when that happens, then there's an interval of time uh, uh, between the rapture and then Antichrist making that treaty with the, the leadership of Israel, that begins the 70th week. How many years in between that? We don't know. But I mention all this for a reason. Because all this time that right now, before that 70th week comes, the church age that we're in, God is trying to use the church to evangelize the non-believers. That's one of our jobs as royal, royal ambassadors for Christ to so that they will be delivered from the wrath to come like we are. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 was verse 9. We're safe from the wrath to come, the church is. Well, we want other people to be safe from the wrath to come. Even, and then, all that time after the church is gone, then there's going to be uh, Jews and Gentiles that are going to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that they're going to evangelize the world and and that's going to happen throughout the, you know, the 144,000 Jews that were in the book of Revelation. 
They're going to be evangelizing the world. There'll be Gentiles, numerous Gentiles who trust in Jesus. People will be killed for their faith, though, during that time because Antichrist will butcher them. He'll, he'll murder them. There'll be a genocide all over again for the Jews. And so that is what's predicted. So we're out here, and we should be doing this, is, get, is trying to save as many people from that, that raft is to come. And even if they, they have to go to it, let's say the church is raptured, and then the Antichrist uh, comes on the scene, he appears, at, at, obviously he will after the church is gone, and he makes this treaty with Israel, let's say in 2020. Okay, it happened the night the rapture. 2020, he does the treaty. That, that means that's the, the, the Daniel 70th week has started. Three and a half years into that, he breaks the treaty, sets himself up as God, and war breaks out. The Armageddon campaign, which ends with the second advent of Christ. And as Christ said, no human being would be left alive if he didn't come back. So he's saying it's going to be a universal uh, uh, confla conflagration. It's going to be a terrible period of warfare on the earth the, day, the, the, the last three and a half years. People will be getting saved during that period as well. Many people will be martyred for their faith during that period. So we have here, this is imminent. This is about to happen. Now, could it happen next year or in a couple of months? Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the 70th week? No, the church would, is, if the church gets raptured tonight, it's got to be some kind of period of time before the treaty is, uh, is uh, made. And so uh, Antichrist will have to be on the scene for a number of years so that he is powerful enough where he, Israel would want to make a treaty with them because he has to eventually become a, uh, a, uh, a uh, that leader of that 10-nation European confederacy, the vibe form of the Roman Empire. So there's a lot of things got to take place. So very important that we, uh, we understand all this. This is, this is basically God's trying to say to, to, to Judah at, the, at this time in Zephaniah's day, hey, it's about to happen. And for them, it did happen within 25 30 years. So therefore, these two verbs here that are actually in the New American Standard translated as I will completely remove, uh, these two verbs, asaf and uh, uh, samishvapeh, they literally mean together, I will gather or I will remove and cause everything to be brought to an end. However, we can translate them, I will exterminate, yes, I'm about to cause everything to be destroyed. Now, as I said before, these two verbs contain Two figures of speech, and uh, one of them is what we call paranomasia. It's P, how you spell it is P A R O N O M A S I A. Now, this refers, what, what does this uh, figure mean? It refers to one word being placed alongside of another, which sounds and seems like a repetition of it. However, they're not the same, but only similar. Now, with this figure, two things are emphasized, and the reader's attention is called to this emphasis by similarity of the sound. Otherwise, we might read the passage and skip over it unnoticed. So this figure here draws the reader's attention to a solemn and important statement. Here, the figure of paranomasia is emphasizing with the reader in Zephaniah's day and us the imminency of God's judgment of the earth's inhabitants as well as the finality and decisiveness of God's decision to execute this judgment. So these two words, they sound similar. They sound similar. Or they sound like uh, very much the same, but they're similar but different. But this is designed to get the reader's attention as to how sol it's a solemn statement here. So God, the Holy Spirit through Zephaniah, is trying to get the, 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 the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the, and the citizens of the kingdom of Judah and the nations of the earth during Zephaniah's day, he's trying to get their attention with the language in the Hebrew. Trying to get their attention. This is very important that they all hear this because they all will be affected. Uh, so the, also, we have another figure of speech. We have the fig with these two words, Asaf and Samishvapeh, we have what we call the figure of alliteration. Alliteration is interesting, um, interesting figure. What is that? What is the figure of alliteration? Well, uh, these are two words. Alliteration is when you have two words, and they pertain uh, pertain to successive words which carry the same letter or the same syllable before or at the beginning. It's the repetition of the same letter or syllable at the beginning of two or more words in close succession, and that's what we have with these two verbs. They both end with the same same letter. In the, in the Hebrew. And they also have the same middle letter as well in the beginning letter. It's kind of interesting, but they have different vowel pointings. 
So they're, they're different words, and they're in different stems and, and whatnot. So what we have here is this figure is also designed to get the attention of the reader as with regards to the solemnity of this prophecy. So what these two figures are doing is it's being, the writer is using these figures of speech to say, I'm being very solemn here. And what does that mean? I'm serious. So when, you know, let's say, uh, let me get the, for the when you're, when you're, when you're, uh, you have, uh, let's say you're a, a kid. No, we won't use the kids. Let's say you're uh, your boss. Your boss is angry, so he calls everybody into the, uh, into, the, into the conference room and says he's unhappy. He's being very solemn. He's not joking around, or she. She's not joking around, and they're all business, and they're very, very serious. And they, they don't make any jokes. They're just saying, being very serious because they want the, their, their employees to get his or her message that, that he's unhappy or she's unhappy, and things have got to change. This is the idea here. God's very unhappy with the earth's inhabitants in the time of Zephaniah. And also, he's unhappy with the earth's inhabitants in our day and age as well. And he will be during the 70th week of Daniel. And he's eventually going to do, there's going to be some serious judgment. See, people, you got to remember, that we studied in the doctrine of uh, salvation. We've studied in the book of Romans and many other times. We're in a world that's ruled by the devil temporarily. He's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. We have, we're all, you got the world of sinners, people in, with sin natures that are antagonistic to God, people who even deny his, his existence, even though he created them and gave them their entire being and gave them his earth and his water and his food. They don't even acknowledge him. Think of what God looks at this world from, as. He is not happy with it. This is not how he designed it to be. I mean, it's, of course he put it into his plan that this rebellion against him would take place, but it's not going to last forever. The rebellion's going to be put down. So he, in grace and in love for the human race, he sent his son to the cross, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life and have the forgiveness of sins. So if you want to avoid the wrath of God, you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior today. And if you don't, you're going to face that wrath, God's righteous indignation. And we're going to see this, this righteous indignation of God throughout the book of Zephaniah. And we see here that we don't want to mess with a God who is angry. This world, you think about this world and what's going on in this world. And it's just everything, you look, you turn on the television and you hear all these ungodly things spoken by all these ungodly people and all these... Uh, these people who are, will, not eat, will not acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God or they reject him, they reject what he's done on the cross for them, they reject his resurrection, they reject every, his teaching, they reject his word, they're antagonistic toward his people, uh, the church, and you look at this world and God is going to deal with it because God is a holy God and nobody's getting away with anything. Now, if you're an unbeliever, you want to be spared facing God's wrath for all of eternity in the lake of fire? Trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, John 3.36. And if you're a believer and you're in apostasy, you better wake up because you're going to have to stand before Christ at the Bema seat and you will lose rewards and you'll have censure at the Bema seat, the loss of rewards, and you're going to be embarrassed at that time because the very one who's died for you on the cross, you've totally thumbed your nose at through your whole life. And a lot of Christians I find are very, a very, a lot of them are in apostasy. They prior, I know that because I see their priorities. I see their, their, what's important to them and what they spend their money and their time on and their time more importantly. And it's a disgrace. They're disgrace as believers. They're, they're totally disrespect God. They totally respect the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They don't respect him at all. They don't know their Bible. Bible illiteracy in this country is a, among Christians is absolutely ridiculously high. And Massachusetts, where I came from, and Iowa at the top five in Ill biblical illiteracy among Christians. You think God's happy about that, people? No. No, he's not. But it looks like, see, this is the thing. People don't see anything. God, it doesn't look like God's doing anything. No disaster has happened in my life. Nothing has happened. The world, the country's still existing. And you just, you're, mis you're, you're basically saying, what an unbeliever would say, 
oh, when a sentence is not executed yet, you're thinking, oh, God's happy with me. Just because he, he hasn't executed the sentence against you, hasn't disciplined you yet, doesn't mean he ain't going to. He will. He's giving you grace so that you will get back in fellowship with him and stop being an apostate. Stop being negative to the word of God. The chickens will come home to roost. And this is not a popular message, but I've sprinkled in God, the gospel and grace all throughout this message. And it, but see, people hear that, 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 that this aspect of God, they don't like to hear it. Even in the church, they don't want to hear this God's wrath, God's righteous indignation. Well, God wouldn't be God if he wasn't angry with sin and evil and rebellion. He's not God then. He's not holy then. We like to, because because we're sinners, we like to form God into our own image and make him out to be who we want him to be, basically Santa Claus. The most, most people, when they think of God, they look at man as, as Santa Claus or an ogre if they're mad at him. Or if they're believers, a lot of believers, they look at him as Santa Claus. Kind of same thing. You know, they want, they want, you know, they just, they want life to be a highway. They want to be, bless me with all kinds of money and sex and wives, and husband and children and all, wives and all this stuff. And you know me, it's, it's like you're treating God like he's, a, it, but God, what God wants for your life, nobody takes the time to, under, what, what would he want me to do? Because they don't know their Bible. They wouldn't know what God wants to do because they don't, they're ignorant of the Bible. It won't pick it up. And it's just unbelievable what's going on. And the church is being, I'll tell you right now, I know God's already working in churches. I know he worked in my church at Prairie View when I was over there. He works in this church. He's working, every, he's working in every church in America and around the world, and he is dealing with the church. Read Revelation chapters 2 and 3. He walks in the midst of the lampstands. And when church splits take place in churches, that's God coming down, Jesus Christ coming down on that church. And permitting the enemy to come in evil to take out and to deal with evil that's going on in churches today. So, so God is someone to be respected, not disrespected. And you show, if you're a believer, and you show your disrespect for God one way is, I'm not going to confess my sins. Oh my gosh. It's one thing to commit the sin, but man, you're going to be that crazy and not confess it to God? What are you crazy? You're gonna be like King David did, where he denied, he, he covered up the fact that he he had uh, uh, the adulterous affair with Bathsheba, and then he had his his her, her husband, an honorable, virtuous man, a courageous man, one of his best soldiers, killed on the battlefield, and he doesn't even confess the sin. He took a prophet, Nathan, a brave man, to go in there and, and confront David with his sin, and he wasn't even gonna acknowledge it to God, confess it to God. He's going to keep right going on as if nothing ever happened. And Christians, they show their disrespect for God when no, they don't confess their sins. They don't keep short accounts with God. You and I should have an attitude. I do this. God's taught me this through the years. Every moment of every day, I'm conscious of him. I'm conscious of him. When I sin, I don't wait till I go to church to confess the sin. I don't care if I'm in my car or what I'm studying or whatever. If, if I sin, I'm confessing. I'm, not keep, I'm keeping short counts with God. I'm respecting him. I respect him. I know he's, he hits hard. Okay? So don't be stupid and say, well, I'm not going to confess my sin and be lazy. You're showing your lack of respect for God. Here's the other way. If you don't confess your sin, what you're doing is, in effect, saying, if you respected God, you would be confessed to sin and stay in fellowship with him. And live your life moment by moment, knowing that Christ could come back at any moment, just like he said he would. Right? Right. Right. So, if you live like as he could, he could never come back at any moment, you're disrespecting him. When your priorities are your animals or your your, your prior, number one priority is your animals or your wife or your husband or your job or money, entertainment, and he gets, he's second in the list or third in the list. It's idolatry. Football, sports, baseball. If he come, if you put those things ahead of your affections, or, or you, those are your uh, top your affections and not him, woe to you. You're, under, you're, you're, you're going to be disciplined by God. What are you, crazy? As if he, and, and this is a, not a popular message. No wonder, no, no wonder no, no, there's not a lot of people following me out here in Iowa. 
because I tell it the way the word of God says. It, it's, I'm communicating what it says. And I want us to have in this ministry a healthy respect for God. Yes, I don't want us to be like, oh, Jesus is my friend. And he, he is my friend. He is a friend of sinners. But too many Christians are, are very flip about it. And they don't respect the Lord. They don't, they're like the child who disrespects their parent and shoots their mouth off at their parent and stomps their feet and throws things and yells at their mother and their father when their mother and father is telling them, hey, no, don't do that. No, I don't want to do it. You ever see a rebellious, disobedient, disobedient kid? It's the most embarrassing thing to a parent for me to say. For a, that's so embarrassing. I'm embarrassed for the parent, how, embar how bad a kid behaves in a store or someplace, and they, just, they have no respect for their parents at all. That's the way a lot of Christians are with, their, with, with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They, they have, no, their behavior is, 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 it actually infuriates God and it, it shows a lack of respect for God because their priorities are wrong and inverted. God comes first. And he, let me say something. You fit, you don't fit God into your schedule. You fit your schedule around God. Your TV programs can wait. Coming to Bible class is more important. And don't, don't disassociate, don't, don't disassociate Bible class with serving the Lord. They go hand in hand. God ordained the local assembly and your pastor to head up a, a group that you ought to attend and serve, and you're supposed to serve the body of Christ. And if you don't come to Bible class, or you come when you, you feel like it, you're showing your lack of respect for the Lord. So your lack of respect for the Lord is manifested by Christians with their lack of attendance and their lack of service in the church, and their lack of knowledge of the word of God shows that they're lazy and can care less, and they don't respect him. They don't act as if he could come back at any time. They're not living as of the, in light of the imminent return of Christ. We don't want to be like that. So we have here the, uh, in the, uh, with a word for, he says in, in Zephaniah 1, 2, I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. The word all is the collective singular construct form of the noun kol. It means everything since it pertains to the totality of creatures on planet earth. Earth. It refers to human beings as well as the animal and bird kingdoms. And in addition, aquatic life, the, bur uh, the, uh, the fish of the sea. And uh, the masculine singular construct form of the noun neum, which is the word for declare, declares, that, that word means, it's actually a noun, and it means declaration, since it pertains to a marker of prophetic discourse as a marker of the origin and authority of the message in the discourse found in the beginning, middle, and mostly on the end of a discourse. So here... The word is a marker of prophetic discourse so as to identify this prophetic declaration in Zephaniah 1-2 as originating from the Lord and thus it expresses the divine authority of the message. This particular phrase, declares the Lord, is another example of the inspiration of Scripture. It's, it, the Scripture is speaking of itself as being from the Lord. Okay, So you see this expressly, remember we saw this last night, the word of the Lord, the prophetic word formula, the very first verse. That's saying the prophecy that's about to come down the pike, and you're going to hear it or read it, is from God. It's divine in origin. God is using the, human, or the prophet as his instrument, human instrument, to communicate this message. And this phrase declares the Lord, when you see it in the Old Testament, it's another, uh, another marker that's tell, it, that brings out the doctrine of inspiration, that the scriptures are inspired by God, the Holy Spirit. So the word, that we, the word for Lord, as we saw last evening, Yahweh, or actually uh, the, the word in the Hebrew is yod heh vah -He, and this word is the covenant-keeping personal name of God, as we pointed out last evening. It's used in connection many times with the salvation of the human race, whether Jew or Gentile, and it's emphasizing the covenant relationship that Zephaniah and the kingdom of Judah had with the Lord, and the revelation that Zephaniah was re receiving from God. Now, this word speaks of the imminency of God, meaning that he involves himself in and concerns himself in, with the, inter, the uh, and intervenes with the affairs of men. Whereas Elohim, translated God in your Old Testament, emphasizes this transcendent character of God. And I love to bring this out, very important. When we look at God, he's transcendent and he's imminent. I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T. 
That means, imminent means, God involves himself in the affairs of men. He's intimately involved with everyone because every decision and every action and every ex the existence of every creature, past, present, and future, has been sovereignly decreed by God to happen, to exist. So he's intimately connected with everything in our lives as individuals, as a church, as a nation, as our, in our families, everything. God just knows everything about us. He's so concerned about us, and he does intervene, intervene in our lives. And he uses people to do, like me to intervene in your life in communicating the word. He could use a doctor, a doctor that God gave wisdom to. He intervenes in your life that way. He intervenes in many ways. Your husband walks into your life. Your wife walks into your life. You have a child. God is intervening in your life. <laughs> so he's intervening in our lives all the time. Well, we look at God as intervening in our lives. He's also transcendent. That means, let's think of, you've heard me say this, the time matter space continuum, which was brought into existence by the creative word act of God, a word of God, it came into existence Prior, outside the time out of space continuum, God exists. God has always existed. He's everywhere present. He's eternal life. He's always existed. There's never been a time that God never existed. He's the only, the only being in the universe that's uncreated. Now, do we, that's called an absolute attribute of God. God is transcendent. So the time out of space, space continuum is like a box, let's just say, as an analogy. God is outside the box. And... He can go in the box. Okay? That's God. God is transcendent. He's outside the box. And he's inside the box. The transcendency of God and the imminency of God. Very important that we have a balanced biblical view of God because that's what the Bible teaches about him. Okay? Now, let's look at my uh, translation of the first two verses of Zephaniah. And now that we, get, uh, we looked at the Hebrew and brought out some things that were not mentioned in the translation or brought out in the translation... We'll read those two, first two verses and then talk about what's going on here in the verse for the rest of the evening. Zephaniah 1.1 1, 1 in my translation. It reads as follows. The message originating from the Lord was communicated to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, grandson of Gedaliah, great-grandson of Amariah, great-great-grandson of Hezekiah, during the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will surely exterminate... Yes, I am about to cause every living thing to be destroyed on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Now, the prophecy of Zephaniah begins with what we call poetic hyperbolic statement, that the Lord will surely exterminate every living thing on the face of the earth. Through the prophet, the Lord declares that he's about to cause each and every living thing to be destroyed that dwells on the face of the earth. And Zephaniah 1.3, which we're going to study tomorrow evening, reveals that these living things include human beings, the animal and bird kingdoms, as well as all marine life or aquatic life. So I said poetic hyperbolic statement. Ze Zephaniah went to is. What is that? Well, it's, it's written in poetry. It's that book of Zephaniah is poetry. And it's hyperbolic, this statement, verse 2. Meaning, it's exaggeration. But there's a purpose for the hyperbole. Now, it's very important. What I mean by this is this declaration is hyperbole. It's an exaggeration. Not in the way you are thinking right now. You're probably thinking, oh, he's, he's bragging or something. No, it's not bragging. It's not that kind of exaggeration. This declaration that God gives us in Zephaniah 1-2 is hyperbole, which is so-called, this is hyperbole, what it is, it, it's, it's, uh, it's so-called because the expression adds to the sense so much that it exaggerates it and enlarges it or diminishes it more than is really meant in fact or when more is said than, uh, than is meant to be literally understood in order to heighten the sense. So let me repeat that very slowly. I went a little fast. Hyperbole is so-called because the expression adds to the sense so much that it exaggerates it, enlarges or diminishes it more than is really meant, in fact. Or when more is said than is meant to be literally understood in order to heighten the sense. This figure emphasizes that the Lord will not kill each and every living being or creature on the earth, but a good majority of them. So there are many indications. How do we know this? How do you know this, Bill, that this is the case? 
When I say, hyper, when he says, I will exterminate, basically, he, I notice he says, I will surely exterminate, yes, I'm about to cause every living thing to be destroyed in the face of the Lord, the earth declares the Lord. It's hyperbole, it's exaggeration, for the, in order to heighten the sense, to get God, God trying to get a point across, meaning there's not going to be any place that's, going to, that's not going to be uh, subject to my judgment. Now listen to me. How do we know that this is the case? I'm saying to you with this, that this is hyperbole because he's not saying that each and every living creature, every fish, every, each and every person, there'll be no human beings on the face of the earth. There'll be no more fish. There'll be no animals. That's not what he's saying. He's, it's, poet, it's poetry. Remember we talked about when we interpret the Bible? This is poetry, okay? Poetry does uses figures like this for reasons. Now, how do we know in the context of the book that God's not, say, God's not saying he's going to wipe out each and every single human being so there's no human beings on the face of the earth again? And same thing with the animals. How do we know that? Well, the contents of the book make this clear. There are many indications within the contents of Zephaniah which indicate the language of Zephaniah is hyperbole. For example, in Zephaniah 2.3, it indicates the possibility that the humble of the land will survive this catastrophic judgment. Don't miss that. Look at Zephaniah chapter 2. Look at verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation without shame. That's Judah. Before the decree takes effect, I will wipe you out. The day passes like the shaft. Before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you. Before any, the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Perhaps you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So the hopes is that people will repent. And if they repent, he ain't going to kill them. So that means some people will survive, right? That statement implies there could be a survival of some people. That's, all, that's not all the evidence I have. For example, Zeph uh, uh, in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, the prophet asserts that although no one will be left, no one at all in the cities of the nations, the Lord also announces that he will purify the lips of the people that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. Look at Zephaniah chapter 3. Let me show you this. Look at verse 6. Zephaniah 3, 6. I have cut off the nations. Their corner towers are in ruins. I have made their streets desolate with no one passing by. Their cities are laid waste without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will revere me. Accept instruction so her dwelling will not be cut off according to all that I have appointed, her, appointed concerning her. But they were eager to corrupt all their deeds. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord. For the day when I rise up as a witness, indeed my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. Then look what he says. For then I will give to these peoples purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. And I brought this out in the introduction. That let's take the tribulation period with Israel. God's going to put Israel through hell on earth with the Antichrist and the tribulation armies. What's going to be the result of it? The nation as a whole is going to turn to him and trust in Jesus as Savior. So the judgment produced a people who believed in him. Okay? So they survived the tribulation period. They survived the tribulation. So those people survived. So when he's talking in Zephaniah 1-2, they're going to wipe out exterminate everything, everyone and everybody on the earth. It's hyperbole. It's poetry. He's, he's trying to emphasize something, that no place on the earth will escape his judgment. And we know from Zephaniah 3, 6 through 9, that some will survive this judgment. Right? Right. So, that could, so his statement in verse 2 of chapter 1 couldn't mean each and every single living creature is going to be gone from the face of the earth. Furthermore, Zephaniah 3.10 and 20 revealed that the Lord's people will also worship him after the earth is judged. Zephaniah 3.10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. Look at verse 20. At that time, I will bring you in, even at the time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. That's going to be fulfilled with Israel after the, uh, at, the second ad, at the second advent of Christ, which ends the tribulation period. So people are going to survive that judgment. 
Okay, the Jews will, uh, the, those who are believing Jews will survive the, the judgment of the tribulation period. Now, Zephaniah chapter 3, 11 through 12, also predicts that the Lord will remove the proud rebels in the midst of Judah and will leave uh, a remnant of humble Jews. Look at uh, chapter 3 again. Look at verse 11. Should have kept my Bible open. In that day, Zephaniah 3.11, you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud and exalting ones and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. Meaning he's saying, I'm going to purge the rebels from Israel. Ezekiel talks about that. That will take place with the second advent of Christ. All unbelievers, Jew and Gentile, anybody who's an unbeliever, is going to be removed from the face of the earth. The majority of the Jews at the second advent will have trusted in Jesus. In direct contrast to his first advent, with only a small remnant believed in Jesus. At the second advent, which ends the tribulation period, a whole mess of people, the whole majority of the nation is going to believe in him. So, Zephaniah chapter 3, 11 and 12, also predicts that the Lord will remove the proud rebels in the midst of Judah and will leave a remnant of humble Jews. And this is also going to be true of the Gentile nations. So, I brought you to all those verses because I'm saying in Zephaniah 1, 2, it's hyperbole. Not each and every human being will be wiped off the face of the earth. How could the human race have perpetuated itself since then, if that was the case in Zephaniah's day? Now, therefore, what's the... What, so, I'm telling you it's hyperbole, poetry. What's the purpose for this? What is the writer trying to... What is the Holy Spirit trying to do through the writer? All right? Well, the totality of destruction theme is merely hyperbole in Zephaniah 1-2 in order to emphasize that there'll be no place on planet Earth which will escape the Lord's judgment and that the renovation of the Earth will be complete. So, for instance, the tribulation period. There's not going to be a nation on the face of the Earth or a continent which will escape and, the, and an ocean which will escape God's wrath during the tri this last three and a half years of the uh, Daniel 70th week. So, no place, will the people survive? Yeah, there'll be people who will survive. Very few, though. But no place on the earth is going to be, escape his judgment. So, now, that, so that being said, now that we know what Zephaniah 1, 2, it says, if you look at, the, look at the verse again in my translation, I will surely exterminate, yes, I'm about to cause every living thing to be destroyed in the face of the earth, declares the Lord. That's hyperbole, and because uh, the writer is using this figure here to emphasize that there'll be no place on planet earth which will escape the Lord's judgment and that the renovation of the earth will be complete. Now, we wrap up this uh, study this evening with some very important thing here. Was this fulfilled? Was this prophecy in Zephaniah 1-2 fulfilled in history? And will it be fulfilled in the future? I said to you, it will be. And it has, to a certain extent. This brings out the principle of, with prophecy of double reference. What is that? An important aspect of interpreting prophecy is understanding and being aware that a passage might have a double reference. This means that a prophecy, events often, in prophecy, events often bear some relationship to one another and are in, are in fact parts of one program. Or in other words, certain events of the future are seen grouped together in one defined area of vision, even though they're at different distances. Like we saw in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Christ quotes it in Luke. And, uh, and when he was pre preaching a sermon in, in, in the synagogue, he stopped short in the middle of Isaiah 61, 2, doesn't quote the rest of it, goes, just reads half of it. Because one, verses 1 and 2a were related to his first advent. The last half of the verse of 2 was for his second advent, the day of vengeance of the Lord. He didn't read that. Because that's going to be yet future at his second advent. Well, in the prophecy, these first and second advents of Christ seem to be all joined together. There's no, there's no indication of a time gap. But see, when Jesus communicated prophecy or interpreted the Old Testament or the apostles, you could see that they see that it was obvious in their interpretations that they understood that. Especially when you come to the prophecies regarding Christ's first and second advent, the apostles, and of course Jesus taught this, there are distance, many times, very great distances in time between the fulfillment of different passages. Though they're all in one paragraph. They could be all in one paragraph. So the prophet, 
What, now, what is that? You ever hear the mountain peaks of prophecy? Who's got the uh, book I gave you to you? I got it, you guys. Uh, uh, what's that? Uh, the, um, Ta- Tim LaHaye and Tommy Ice. What's that called? That's a great book. And he talks about, read it tonight, giant. You'll see, it says the mountain peaks of prophecy. What does that mean? Old Testament prophets, let's take the, the first and second advents of Christ. They were looking, it's like looking at a mountain peaks. You see a mountain range? You don't, they don't, you don't see in the valley, but you can see the mountain peaks, right? Same thing with the prophets, and it's analogous to that. The prophets of Israel, with regards to the first, second advents of Christ, they could see those, and, can, you know, and take one thing after the other, but they didn't see the interval of time, the valley in between the mountain peaks. That's the idea, okay? Now, for example, many times, the major prophets issued prophecies concerning the Babylonian captivity, the events of the day of the Lord, the return from Babylon, the worldwide dispersion of Israel, and their future return to the land, and grouped them all together, seemingly indiscriminately. Connected to this, when interpreting prophecy, the interpreter must observe the time relationships, meaning that some events are widely separated as to the, the time of their fulfillment are sometimes treated within one prophecies, prophecy I mentioned before. For example, the prophecies concerning the first and second advents of Christ are spoken of together in one paragraph or one chapter as though they were going to take place at the same time. This phenomena is also seen with the second and third dispersion of the Jews which are viewed as taking place without interruption many times in scripture. So the prophet may view widely separated events as continuous or future things as either past or present. Also, with regards to prophecy, you see we use the phrase a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. With regards to this prophecy in Zephaniah 1-2, to a certain extent, it was fulfilled in Zephaniah's contemporary circumstances. Uh, in, with the Babylonian invasions. To a certain extent, that prophecy in Zephaniah 1-2 was fulfilled in the, with the Babylonian invasions. And I'll talk about this, because obviously Nebuchadnezzar didn't conquer China and all these other nations. He didn't go out. There was not war in those other... It was, in, in, the, in the biblical writer's view, the world, the, the nations which Israel sat, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he uh, waged war against the Mesopotamian region, which is Iraq and Iran today, and also the Mediterranean region, which is you know, the Israel and all that area, and, the, and e, you know, Egypt. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar attacked Egypt. He con- so Nebuchadnezzar, the known world to the, the Israelite, all the nations in the Mediterranean and Mesopotamian world that they came into contact with, came under this, this, um, this heavy hand of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire, Nebuchadnezzar just wiped out the whole, those two regions, major regions of the world. So to, in a near sense, Zephaniah's prophecy, Zephaniah 1-2, was fulfilled. But actually, ultimately, it's going to be fulfilled, we know, according to what Revelations chapter 6 through 18 teaches. And Matthew 20, uh, in Jesus' Olivet Discourse, and Matthew 24 and 25, that this prophecy in Zephaniah 1-2 is going to be filled in a far sense, meaning... Down in the future, sometime in the future, during the, tr- the, the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week, called the Great Tribulation Period by Expositors, ending with Christ's second advent. So this prophecy in Zephaniah 1-2 is looking for its ultimate fulfillment during that future period, which is future to the rapture of the church. So the Lord's prophetic declaration in Zephaniah 1-2, was fulfilled in a near sense, as I said before, through Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, sacking Judah and her neighbors in the Mediterranean region. How do we know this? Well, it's indicated by the prophetic declarations that appear in Zephaniah 1-3, all the way to Zephaniah 3-7. And these verses speak of the destruction of Judah and her Gentile neighbors, which took place through the Babylonian invasions led by Nebuchadnezzar. Did you hear what I just said? How do we know that this was fulfilled in a near sense? Zephaniah 1 3 to Zephaniah 3 7. If it, we read those, read them tonight. And they speak of the destruction of Judah and her Gentile neighbors, which took place in history, we know, through the Babylonian invasions led by Nebuchadnezzar. Zephaniah 1 3 through 2, all the way to chapter 2, verse 3, describes the historical situation in the kingdom of Judah when the Babylonian invasions took place. Also, Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 4 through 15, contain references to Gentile nations which surrounded Judah, which, like Judah, were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. All the, Israel's neighbors 
or Ju Judah's neighbors, were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's armies as well. He attacked Egypt too. He conquered Egypt. Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, contains reference to, references to geographical places in Israel's day, J Judah's day in the 6th century B.C., uh, Eshkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, Crete, and the Philistines. And Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 8 through 12, contains references to the nations of Moab and Ammon and Ethiopia. All were in, in existence in, in the time of Zephaniah and Judah. Zephaniah 2, verses 13 through 15, contains a reference to Assyria and the great city of Nineveh, which were destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. So it was, if you, the contents of the book tell us that it was fulfilled to a certain extent in a near sense in the days of Nebuchadnezzar in the 6th century BC. However, as I also mentioned, the prophetic declaration here in Zephaniah 1-2 will ultimately be fulfilled in a far sense during the tribulation portion of Daniel's 70th week. What's an indication in the book? Well, it's indicated by the prophetic declarations that appear at the end of the book in Zephaniah chapter 3 verses 8 through 20. They contain references, these verses, to the restoration and regeneration of the nation of Israel and the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, which immediately follows, as we know, from Revelation and Matthew and, and the Lord's Olivet Discourse and Daniel, they immediately follow the tribulation portion of Daniel's 70th week. We saw that in Daniel chapters 2 and 7. Nowhere in Judah or Israel's history was Judah or Israel regenerated with a Messiah living in their midst, rejoicing over them, as Zephaniah chapter 3 says on two different occasions. It's not, that hasn't happened yet. So the prophetic declaration that appears in Zephaniah 1-2 is echoing the one in, that was issued in Isaiah chapter 24, 1 through 6, and in Isaiah chapter 24, 19 through 23. So this prof prophecy in Zephaniah 1, 2, uh, or excuse me, in Isaiah 24, will also be fulfilled in a far or ultimate sense, we could say, during the tribulation portion of Daniel's 70th week. So there's a passage in, in Matthew, in the Lord's Olive Discourse. I think it's in 24. Hold your place. Look at Matthew. I'll tell you which chapter I want you to go. Matthew 24, 25. I don't know which one yet. Okay. Oh, where is it? Okay. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, Jesus, this is called his Olivet Discourse. Therefore, they asked him when, it, you know, when the king, his kingdom was set up, the millennial kingdom. The, he's talking to Jews. They're asking about this. The church wasn't even mentioned. Church wasn't even thought of yet. Wasn't even revealed yet. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of, de of, 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 uh, of, spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Daniel 9, 27, right? regarding Antichrist, the abomination of desolation. Then those who are in Judea, who are living then, must flee to the mountains. He's talking about, he's prophesying to that generation, people. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath day. Now remember, what do we learn in Daniel 9.27? In the middle of the, the seven-year period, the seven-year treaty with Israel and the Antichrist, Antichrist is going to break the, break the treaty, set himself up in the rebuilt Jewish temple. Paul talks about that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 5, and declare himself as God. The abomination of desolation spoke, prophesied in Daniel 9, 27. Basically, he's going, to, he's going to go between the cherubim on the mercy seat and talk as if he was the God of Israel. Okay? So that's going to happen. What happens? The Armageddon campaign begins. War breaks out, and the that'll begin the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. Now look at what he says, Jesus says. For then there'll be great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Now look what he says. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So he's basically saying, It'll be a universal disaster. If he doesn't come back, 
there will, there will actually not be anybody left on the earth, no human being left on the earth, if he didn't come back, if he let it keep going. So Zephaniah 1.2, which in my translation says to us, it says, uh, yes, I will surely exterminate. Yes, I'm about to cause every living thing to be destroyed in the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Jesus is alluding to that in Matthew, in his Olivet Discourse. So Zephaniah 1.2, Jesus is talking about that period where if Christ doesn't come back to end the tribulation period, there would actually not be any, human beings would be exterminated. I mean, they, they would be in total annihilation, meaning no living human being would be left on the face of the earth if he didn't come back. That's what he's saying. So Zephaniah 1-2 is actually, will be fulfilled ultimately, literally, completely, no hyperbole involved, well, it is a little bit hyper because some people do survive the tribulation period. But you know what I'm saying? It's, it's much more, it's, it's much great. It'll find its greater fulfillment during the tribulation period because it happened in the Mesopotamian, and it was fulfilled in the Mesopotamian region and Mediterranean region in Nebuchadnezzar's day in the 6th century BC. But not all the nations of the earth like China or Russia were affected. But we know from Revelation 6 to 18, Daniel, chapters 2, 7, 9, uh, Daniel uh, 11. Uh, we also know uh, with Ezekiel 38 and 39, Russia's going to be affected by this period. All, all the nations of the earth will be affected. A comparison of scripture will tell, tells us that. That all the earth, every continent, every peop all peoples on every continent, co continent will be affected by this universal judgment during the tribulation period. Okay? So, let's wrap up this study in Zephaniah 1-2. We see that the, this prophetic declaration in Zephaniah 1-2 and the others contained in the book express the sovereignty of God, the God of Israel, over not only Judah, but every nation on earth. And it also reveals that the God of Israel is the judge of all humanity, both Jew and Gentile. Zephaniah 1-2 is also describing for us that God, the God of Israel, who we, the Bible tells us, the New Testament, Jesus taught us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It, God intervenes. This verse, Zephaniah 1-2, tells us, as I mentioned before, that God does intervene in the affairs of mankind because it speaks of God judging Judah and the nations, and this is called the imminency of God. As I said before, God's doing this through war. God, that's how God intervenes in people's lives many times. Not just blessing, but by war. And you know what? And you know what? It's, you know, God, you hear, you hear the dark side of love I told you about? God will do whatever it takes. Whatever suffering, he'll allow it to happen just so people will trust in his son and not have to face his wrath for all of eternity. He will do whatever it takes. So, Lastly, Zephaniah 1-2, this prophetic declaration also speaks of the God of Israel's wrath, or we can say his righteous indignation, which refers to his legitimate anger towards evil and sin, since both are contrary to his holiness or perfect character and nature. Did Jesus ever get visibly angry? Oh yeah. Read your Gospels. Of course he got. He was furious. And he, it's his righteous indignation, meaning he legitimately was angry. He had a legitimate reason for to be angry. See, some people think anger is always sin. Well, for us human beings, usually it is because our anger many times is, motive, is, is prompted by our sin nature. We're frustrated with somebody, you know, the wife burned the eggs, you throw the, you know, you throw your, 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 your newspaper or whatever, or your wife is mad at her husband and, you know, she, you know, she flips his beer or something. I don't know. You know somebody goes, gets mad at somebody, or ang you know, or gets, yells at somebody and, you know, they're all they get. It's usually, it's, it's not righteous indignation many times. Most times. Nearly all the time. Once in a while, a human being who's a godly person will actually have a legitimate reason to be angry. Is actually God's using them to express his anger through that person. Because that person has God's interests in mind. Jesus, he was furious with the money changes in the temple. He was angry. He flipped those tables over. He, was, he wasn't sitting he cared about God's holiness. He cared, he had God's interests in mind. Therefore, he was not sinning when he got angry. 
He got angry at people in Israel, his own disciples, because they wouldn't try, believe in what he was saying. Lack of faith gets God angry. So God does get angry. And anger is not always sin. It, it, could, be legit, it could be righteous indignation. Now, don't all you go over and get yell at your husband and your wives and your parents and say, I can just see a kid going, well, I'm expressing righteous indignation. No, <laughs> don't, don't pull that. Don't do that. And don't, don't, because I've had one time one guy, I can you a funny story. We'll wrap this up. This guy is having marriage problems. And he, he met, you know, I was talking about this righteous indignation. And, you know, he was he having problems in his marriage. And he was like, I said, nah, 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 your best bet is not get angry because, you know, I didn't want to say he was in but I was like, you know, you really don't know what, you really need to control your temper and you don't know what righteous indignation is yet because you don't have enough of God's word in your heart and you're not, even, you're not applying it enough. I didn't say that to him. I was saying in my head, this guy, I said, no, 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 no. Best bet is be safe, you know. Pe- pe- uh, don't uh, let, let uh, you know, don't, don't be trying to say, you know, I know some people, they start, you know, oh, this is righteous indignation. When in reality, they're just using what the past to say as an excuse to get mad at their wife and yell at their wife. And don't do that. If I ever find that out, or the husband, if I ever, or the parent, don't, if I ever find that, better run, because I don't like when people take scripture and, like, you know, <laughs> you ever hear the, the I've heard, you know, guys say, well, you're going to obey me. Honey, you got to obey. I heard of, this is this is a big problem that's going on in the church. I don't mean to be too diverting, uh, divert too far, far off, but there are people in the they're actually in the church there. It was a big problem. Most people don't really realize this. Pastors do that. When you know, you, t- you, you the Bible says, you know, wives obey your husbands in all things. There are guys who will actually go and abuse their wives verbally and even physically, and they say, you got to obey me. Yeah, it also says you're supposed to love your wife like Christ loved the church. I mention that because I can't stand when I hear people misinterpreting and misusing what I'm teaching. It makes me, gives me righteous indignation. I have every right, you're twisting God's word so you can, you can, and use, so you can sin and abuse your wife. Ah, don't ever let me hear that. That's going on. That's criminal. You're hitting your wife, you're, you toss you in jail is what you should do. And I'd love to deck you with it if I could. Anybody t- lays a hand on a woman is crazy and a, and a wimp. How did I get on this? Oh, yeah. Don't want to misapply scripture. Don't do that. So uh, we have here a great study, universal judgment uh, that is uh, mentioned here. It, will be, it was fulfilled to a near extent during the days of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian invasions in the 6th century BC. Ultimately, it's going to find its fulfillment and the, the tribulation period, the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. So we'll pick this up tomorrow, which is quite interesting with tomorrow's class in verse 3. We'll, be, uh, we'll take a couple of nights to do verse 3. Tomorrow we're going to see that the Lord will cause the destruction of the human race, animal, bird kingdoms, and marine life. And of course that's, again, hyperbole, but, uh, uh, t- but it's emphasizing that there'll be no place on the earth which will escape his judgment. So we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. And it's kind of interesting how... He mentions the bird king, the animal kingdom. It's actually alluding to Genesis, you know, when the creation happened. There's a kind of, a, it's a kind of a, he mentions the same categories again in this chapter. Basically, it, it, he's alluding to Genesis, but he's flip-flopping things. It's kind of interesting. And because uh, he mentions man first, whereas in Genesis, the animal kingdom, everything, marine life is mentioned before man, man's last thing, the capstone of God's creation. But in this, man gets first. And there's a reason for this, because man, I'm giving it all away for tomorrow, man is actually the head over creation, so the animal kingdom suffers because of mankind. Pick this up tomorrow evening. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would encourage us and challenge us and rebuke us and guide us and instruct us in what we've heard here this evening. We pray that this class would be a blessing to your people and bring glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.